contains a vital principle. Because it is the creative principle of the universe, and by its nature will combine with other similar thoughts. As the one purpose of life is growth, all principles underlying existence must contribute to give it effect. Thought, therefore, takes the form, and the law of growth eventually brings it into manifestation. You may freely choose what you think, but the result of your thought is governed by an immutable law, any line of thought persisted in cannot fail to produce its result in character, health, and circumstances of the individual. Methods whereby we can substitute habits of constructive thinking for those which we have found produce only undesirable effects are therefore of primary importance. We all know that this is by no means easy. Mental habits are difficult to control, but it can be done, and the way to do it is to begin at once to substitute constructive thought for destructive thought. Form the habit of analyzing every thought, if it is necessary. If its manifestation in the objective will be a benefit not only to yourself, but to all whom it may affect in any way, keep it, treasure it. It is of value. It is in tune with the infinite. It will grow and develop and produce fruit a hundredfold. On the other hand, it will be well for you to keep this quotation from George Matthew Adams in mind. Learn to keep the door shut. Keep out of your mind, out of your office, and out of your world. Every element that seeks admittance with no definite helpful end in view. If your thought has been critical or destructive and has resulted in any condition of discord or inharmony in your environment, it may be necessary for you to cultivate a mental attitude which will be conductive to constructive thought. The imagination will be found to be a great assistance in this direction. The cultivation of the imagination leads to the development of the ideal of which your future will emerge. The imagination gathers up the material by which the mind weaves the fabric in, which your future is to be clothed. Imagination is the light by which we can penetrate new worlds of thought and experience. Imagination is the mighty instrument by which every discoverer, every inventor, opened the way from precedent to experience. Precedent said, it cannot be done. Experience said, it is done. Imagination is a plastic power, molding the things of sense into new forms and ideals. Imagination is the constructive form of thought which must precede every constructive form of action. A builder cannot build a structure of any kind until he has first received the plans from the architect, and the architect must get them from his imagination. The captain of industry cannot build a giant corporation, which may coordinate hundreds of smaller corporations and thousands of employees and utilize millions of dollars of capital until he has first created the entire work in his imagination. Objects in the material world are as clay in the potter's hand. It is in the master mind that the real things are created, and it is by the use of the imagination that the work is done. In order to cultivate the imagination, it must be exercised. Exercise is necessary to cultivate mental muscle as well as physical muscle. It must be supplied with nourishment or it cannot grow. Do not confuse imagination with fancy or that form of daydreaming in which some people like to indulge. Daydreaming is a form of mental dissipation which may lead to mental disaster. Constructive imagination means mental labor by some considered to be the hardest kind of labor, but if so, it yields the greatest returns, for all the great things in life have come to men and women who had the capacity to think, to imagine, and to make their dreams come true. When you have become thoroughly conscious of the fact that mind is the only creative principle, that it is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent, and that you can consciously come into harmony with this omnipotence through your power of thought, you will have taken a long step in the right direction. The next step is to place yourself in position to receive this power. As it is omnipresent, it must be within you. We know that this is so because we know that all power is from within, but it must be developed, unfolded, cultivated. In order to do this, we must be receptive, and receptivity is acquired just as physical strength is gained by exercise. 
the law of attraction will certainly and unerringly bring to you the conditions, environment, and experiences in life corresponding with your habitual characteristic predominant mental attitude. Not what you think once in a while while you're at church or have just read a good book, but your predominant mental attitude is what counts. You cannot entertain weak, harmful, and negative thoughts 10 hours a day and expect to bring about beautiful, strong, and harmonious conditions by 10 minutes of strong, positive, creative thought. Real power comes from within. All power that anybody can possibly use is within man, only waiting to be brought into visibility by first recognizing it and then affirming it as his, working it into his consciousness until he becomes one with it. People say that they desire abundant life, and so they do. But so many interpret this to mean that if they will exercise their muscles or breathe scientifically, eat certain foods in certain ways, drink so many glasses of water every day of just a certain temperature, keep out of drafts, they will attain the abundant life they seek. The result of such method is but indifferent. However, when man awakens to the truth and affirms his oneness with all life, he finds that he takes on the clear eye, the elastic step, the vigor of youth. He finds that he had discovered the source of all power. All mistakes are but the mistakes of ignorance. Knowledge gaining and consequent power is what determines growth and evolution. The recognition of demonstration of knowledge is what constitutes power, and this power is spiritual power. And this spiritual power is the power which lies in the heart of all things. It is the soul of the universe. This knowledge is the result of man's ability to think. Thought is therefore the germ of man's conscious evolution. When man ceases to advance in his thoughts and ideals, his forces immediately begin to disintegrate and his countenance gradually registers these changing conditions. Successful men make it their business to hold ideals of the conditions which they wish to realize. They constantly hold in mind the next step necessary to the ideal for which they are striving. Thoughts are the materials with which they build and the imagination is their mental workshop. Mind is the ever-moving force with which they secure the persons and circumstances necessary to build their success structure. And imagination is the matrix in which all great things are fashioned. If you have been faithful to your ideal, you will hear the call when circumstances are ready to materialize your plans and results will correspond in the exact ratio of your fidelity to your ideal. The ideal steadily held is what predetermines and attracts the necessary conditions for its fulfillment. It is thus that you may weave a garment of spirit and power into the web of your entire existence. It is thus that you may lead a charmed life and be forever protected from all harm. It is thus that you may become a positive force whereby conditions of opulence and harmony may be attracted to you. This is the leaven which is gradually permeating the general consciousness and is largely responsible for the conditions of unrest which are everywhere evident. In the last part, you created a mental image. You brought it from the invisible into the visible. In this video, I want you to take an object and follow it back to its origination. See of what it really consists. If you do this, you will develop imagination, insight, perception, and sagacity. These come not by superficial observation of the multitude, but by a keen analytical observation, which sees below the surface. It is the few who know that the things which they see are only effects and understand the causes by which these effects were brought into existence. Take the same position as before and visualize a battleship. See the grim monster floating on the surface of the water. There appears to be no life anywhere about. All is silent. You know that by far the largest part of the vessel is underwater, out of sight. You know that the ship is as large and as heavy as a 20-story skyscraper. You know that there are hundreds of men ready to spring into their appointed task instantly. You know that every department is in charge of able, trained, skilled officials who have proven themselves competent to take charge of this marvelous piece of mechanism. You know that although it lies apparently oblivious to everything else, it has eyes which see everything for miles around, and nothing is permitted to escape its watchful vision. You know that while it appears quiet, submissive, and innocent, it is prepared to hurl a steel projectile weighing thousands of pounds at any enemy miles away. This and much more you can bring to mind with comparatively no effort whatsoever. But how did the battleship come to be where it is? 
How did it come into existence in the first place? All of this you want to know if you are a careful observer. Follow the great steel plates through the foundries. See the thousands of men employed in their production. Go further back and see the ore as it comes from the mine. See it loaded on the barges or cars. See it melted and properly treated. Go back further and see the architect and engineers who planned the vessel. Let the thought carry you back still even further in order to determine why they planned the vessel. You will see that you are now so far back that the vessel is something intangible. It no longer exists. It is now only a thought existing in the brain of the architect. But from where did the order come to plan the vessel? Probably from the Secretary of Defense. But probably this vessel was planned long before the war was thought of. And that Congress has to pass a bill, appropriating the money. Possibly there was an opposition, and speeches for or against the bill. Whom do these congressmen represent? They represent you and me. So that our line of thought begins with the battleship and ends with ourselves. And we find in the last analysis that our own thought is responsible for this and many other things of which we seldom think. And a little further reflection will develop the most important fact of all, and that is, if someone had not discovered the law by which this tremendous mass of steel and iron could be made to float upon the water, instead of immediately going to the bottom, the battleship could not have come into existence at all. This law is that the specific gravity of any substance is the weight of any volume of it compared with an equal volume of water. The discovery of this law revolutionized every kind of ocean travel, commerce, and warfare, and made the existence of the battleship, aircraft carriers, and the cruise ships possible. You will find exercises of this kind invaluable. When the thought has been trained to look below the surface, everything takes on a different appearance. The insignificant becomes significant, the uninteresting, interesting. The things which we suppose to be of no importance at all are seen to be the only really vital things in existence. Part 8. Study questions with answers. What is the imagination? The imagination is a form of constructive thought, the light by which we penetrate new worlds of thought and experience, the mighty instrument by which every inventor or discoverer opened the way from precedent to experience. What is the result of imagination? The cultivation of imagination leads to the development of the ideal out of which your future will emerge. How may it be cultivated? By exercise. It must be supplied with nourishment or it cannot live. How does imagination differ from daydreaming? Daydreaming is a form of mental dissipation while imagination is a form of constructive thought, which must precede every constructive action. What are mistakes? The result of ignorance. What is knowledge? The result of man's ability to think. What is the power with which successful men build? Mind is the very moving force with which they secure the persons and circumstances necessary to complete their plans. What predetermines the result? The ideal held steadily in mind attracts the necessary conditions for its fulfillment. What is the result of a keen analytical observation? The development of imagination, insight, perception, and sagacity. To what do these lead? These lead to opulence and harmony. So what do you think? Let me know in the comments if you agree or feel differently. And thanks for watching.